It's a delight to have Professor Lin with us here today. Uh, he's uh, an expert in many things. He's going to be talking to us today about uncertainty quantification. And, um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So my name is Guang Lin. So, so at Purdue, I was uh, trying to develop a data science program. So, so I was in charge of the data science consulting service to provide data science consulting to the like, corporate partners to the faculty who have data but they don't know much about the machine learning. So we try to help them um, processing the data, do the machine learning. And also we are launching our data science undergrad program, a master program. So I was in charge of our curriculum development, so how to design and integrate the undergrad data science program and master program. And also you can see, uh, so I was involved in, in like a 40 department department. I was involved in mathematics, also statistics. Uh, Mechanical engineering, also Earth's atmosphere, uh, planetary science, like four different departments. I was uh, have a joint department there. So, like this figure, I was basically showing you this what I did after my get my PhD at Brown. So I joined the well, DOE lab at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. So this is all the work I did at the Pacific Northwest. So at that time, we worry about uh, the global warming, so we try to improve the model of predict capabilities. So this is uh, like a, this is the satellite data about the Central American the pre prediction of the precipitation. So this is an observation. This is using the default parameter. Okay, I try to make a prediction. You can see this are uh, not matching exactly, right? The red color, the more red color, represents the more the like, millimeter per day precipitation. So you can say don't they don't match exactly, right? This means the model predicted capability is not that good, right? So they cannot match, make a very good prediction. So that's why. We try to do the inverse UQ problems, try to calibrate the parameters. So this is uh, our like improved uh, calibrate uh, predictions. You can say it match better with the evaluation, but still not exact, right? This is a uh, it's so called model uncertainty, right? So I do the parameter calibration, but still there's unknown physics, right? So we need to uh, do some like a model requirement, right? This is uh, what the gym probably talk about, right? <laughs> so, so, so today I will talk about that too, as well. Okay. I think uh, so. Today I'm gonna cover like a UQ, right? So I was like, uh, and so we first do UQ in the early 2000s. We do a lot of UQ studies. I think Jim and uh, my Peter White George have the first uh, UQ special issue at GCP, right? I remember that I have people there too. So, so in the early 2000s, I do a lot of UQs, and later on, when the data science uh, like uh, come up, we do a lot of those. Scientific machine learning, right? Do, we try to aim for the scientific complex problems such as climate, for example. So why UQ, right? UQ is uh, we try to using data try to improve the high fidelity models, or the predictabilities, right? To enable scientific discovery and also make a critical decisions. So our one example is we try to uh, using the information from satellite, from different radar, from different resources, try to improve our model predict capabilities. So we have a model, but the model is not perfect. Right? So we want to incorporate all the real-time information. So this is one example. We want to make predictions of uh, where the hurricane is going to land. Right? It's going to land at uh, different times. Right? Maybe land in Tampa or Miami. Right? We want to know where exactly they're going to land so that we can have make better decisions to evacuate people right? so that can save lives. So this is one example we try to incorporate the hurricane forecast information using satellite and relay information. So this is kind of like a 5 p.m. Friday, 5 p.m. Saturday, 5 p.m. Sunday, 5 p.m. Monday. So we have hourly, like daily predictions, right? You want to incorporate all this real-time information to make better predictions. So this is uh, what the UQ can help you on the decision making. So this is one of the joint work I work with uh, Randy Levac. So we were doing this 2011 we did Tohoku tsunami on um, March 11th, 2011. So what happened in this is uh, there's an earthquake happened in this uh, Tohoku. Okay, the earthquake induced this tsunami. Okay, so the the top figure shows the three hours. Okay, tsunami, and the, the, the bottom one is what the nine hour after the earthquake. So there's a hurricane hit the a city called Crescent City that's very near San Francisco. Okay, so this. Tsunami flush out to this Crescent City. Okay, so so it's kind of so we, we try to do some uh, UQ study on this one. We try to build up a so-called uh, uh, tsunami forecast hazard map. So basically, in the probability sense, right? So can we like uh, make a in the probability sense to evaluate uh, the 
the basically what's the probability of the height of the wave, right, exceeds some levels, right? So the x coordinate basically represents the meter, how high the wave is, so it's a two meter, four meter, six meter. The higher the wave, the lower the probabilities, right? So we want to know what's the probability it's gonna get flooded in terms of the height and also in terms of the, the locations. So this is a map of the Crescent City coastline, right? You want to know which area will more have high probability get flooded, then that way you can like put more resource on the location where it has high probability get flooded. Okay, so that's just a kind of build up a hazard map in the public sense. So this is a yes. Just a quick question: Why is there sort of a step there? Is it you hit some threshold and then? Yeah. So the basically, I think in the lower in the yeah, some it seems like that. It's like if it's less than one meter, right? So one meter something, it, you have a high probability, right? You can get that height, and with uh, some like a. Beyond like two, you have a very lower probability. Yeah, seems there's a stretch over there. So this is a, another like we need a, like model validations, right? So in terms of the interconnected systems, this is one of the power system blackout happened in 1996, August 10, between California and Oregon interconnections. The top figure represents what really happens. There's a voltage drop, and this voltage drop triggers some oscillations. Then this oscillation was amplified and caused a cascade failure. And the bottom one is what model predicts. The model say, I can capture the voltage drop. However, it, because my model has uh, all this uh, artificial damping there, so it damp out all these small oscillations, and uh, I, using model, you will not be able to predict uh, this amplified cascade failure. So the control room will not be able to see it's going to cause a disaster failure, right? So therefore, the, the control room will not do anything if they're just using the model predictions. So that's why it's very important that if you want to avoid blackout, you have to encrypt the real-time data. So that's why nowadays we have a lot of sensor information put in the grid, so we can real-time monitor. But however, it puts challenge on this uh, uh, state estimations algorithms. So this is uh, today, right? We are using static slow local view. Basically, it takes us two to four minutes to solve a nonlinear equation on a single processor using the LU linear solvers. Okay, but tomorrow we I hope we can using uh, reduce the computation cost using parallel computer right to do the CG solvers. Right. However, in future we want to because the real time data we get on this PMU sensor is one over thirty seconds. It's very fast, right? But how you, can you utilize this very fast algorithm because this slow side on our algorithm side? So how do you utilize this fast data? Try to using the common feature of these techniques. Try to uh, make a prediction on the differential algebra equations. Right. So this is a you can see we want to make predictions. So this yellow region is what the prediction is about. Right. We want to using all this one over thirty second data coming right sequentially. We want to use that to make a better predictions. So that way we can achieve real time monitoring of the power systems. Okay. So but uh, it uh, takes uh, some techniques to do that. And faster algorithms, parallel algorithms, all that to achieve the fast network. So this is another work I'm doing on this uh, blood calculation pathways. So also this is related to like a, a personalized medicine related work. So this is uh, we try to evaluate uh, what's uh, related to the blood calculation. We identified the 37 chemical reactions, right, that affect these uh, blood calculations. The red color represents the activities, this uh, uh, phenomenon, and the, the blue color represents inhibitors. Okay? So we uh, plot this uh, chemical reaction network, basically try to show what's the effect for each individual interactions, and uh, uh, also what's the interaction between two reactions. Okay? The, each parameter represents the individual reactions. The bigger the circle, that represents the whole impact on these individual reactions. Okay? And this line represents the how K14 interacts with K4, okay? It's a, a correlation between these two reactions, okay? Why is it useful? Because this can help us to, to design a personalized medicine. For example, I design a personalized medicine to block, a, for a particular patient, I can block a, these uh, three reactions, right? If I design that, you can see the sensitivity can shift, right? So that I can design a personalized medicine for the second okay, reactions. Uh, different pathways. So this can help us to design some uh, personal treatment. And uh, so you look back at one of the early days I was doing on this uh, UQ side, right? This is one of the work I'm doing for the stochastic piston problem. So this is what basically I try to study 
what's a small perturbation on the piston, how it can affect on the shock pathways, right? So, so this is, I developed some uh, asymptotic analysis, right? Try to uh, derive some asymptotic uh, uh, analysis to represent the uh, perturbation of the shock pathways. So this uh, basically represents the, uh, the, the variance of the perturbation shock pathways is uh, a scale with uh, like a, a square, okay, T square in early time, but the later scale with linear time in later, okay? So this kind of, a, uh, so this was published at uh, the TS, so we got this work. More interestingly, I also uh, developed so-called uh, uh, how this uh, supersonic flow past a rough wedge. Right. So this work is uh, tried, uh, like uh, motivated by like uh, how the boundary affected the shock. Okay. So this idea is uh, if this uh, a shock, right, uh, pass a wedge. If the wedge is smooth, it's just a oblique shock. Okay. After shock, it will be very smooth. Okay, then no, nothing okay, going on here. But however, because of the shock can induce these uh, compression expansion waves, so it kind of weaken this shock, okay? So why is it useful, right? It, so I will show you. So the usefulness is, uh, first of all, we derive this uh, kind of symptotic, stochastic symptotic analysis to evaluate how this roughness going to affect, basically going to have the compressible wave, have infinity expansions, okay? on the compressor waves. And uh, more useful is it can help to design a rough scheme for the airfoil, right? give you another way to control the, the lift and the, and the drag force. So the idea is if you put a rough scheme underneath of the airfoil, right, it's going to weaken the shock below, okay? so that you can get extra lift, right? because you only weaken the, uh, the shock underneath. Okay? You have the smooth surface on the top. Okay? So, so basically, you gain actual lift by using this kind of design. Okay? So instead of you doing the attack angle right, to gain the lift, so this is just another way to help you to have a, a micro choice on the gain the actual lift. So this work published in the review letter. Uh, so we also uh, derived some scaling law on the how to scale the with the correlation length and the amplitude of the roughness uh, in terms of the drag force and the lift force. And uh, so now I'm going to go to the online. So first I'm going to talk about the UQ. I'm going to talk about the, some challenges in UQ. Then I will talk about uh, what UQ can do for deep learning. Because one of the big criticize for deep learning is uh, uh, how do you quantify the uncertainty? How do you trust it? Can you build a confident interval for that? Right? Then another criticize for the uh, deep learning is uh, what's the interpretation? Right? Can you interpret that? Can we learn from that? Right? It's not like you just give me a black box, say, oh, it's give you a good prediction, just use it, right? But we want to find out the inside, what can help us to gain knowledge, right? So, so, so that's why I'll talk about the, what you can do for the physical law of discovery. Can we learn something from the data? Can we learn a, like a naive stock situation from it, right? So then I will talk about how you could across different scales and then talk about uh, some future work and also uh, like uh, what I'm doing right now at Purdue about the design consulting and the you know, building up a design ecosystem in Purdue. So the UQ algorithm we focus is so-called general quantum chaos. It's basically a special method, okay, in the stochastic domain. So the idea is this is a Nobel winner, right? He discovered this uh, uh, called a winner chaos. The idea is, is you expand a second order random process by uh, a basis, right? This is random basis times a coefficient. And uh, the philosophy when Nobel Wiener invented this is like a variable separation, a separate variables, right? So basically, the, the stochastic part all goes to into the basis, and all the deterministic part go to the coefficient. Then, if he choosing the orthogonal basis, then you can use in the Gagan projection to get rid of the stochastic part. Then you only have the deterministic left, right? Then you can transfer. A stochastic problem become a distant problem. Okay, then you get rid of the random part, so you don't need to do the color anymore. Right, you just solve a deterministic system. So that's the basic uh, the philosophy behind it. Uh, to improve the scalability, we are using the the choosing the basis to be orthogonal. So the choice of the, this basis is, for example, the Hermite. You can use Gaussian uh, distribution. You can choose the gender polynomial for uniform distributions. Right, so. This uh, my advisor's uh, work on this one. 
So this is basically, once you have that, then you can uh, do one choice to garden projection, a second choice you can do collocation projection on the problems. So assume you want to solve a, a nonlinear operator L, use the unknown, right, because it's a random input, right? What you do is uh, you compute the residual, okay? Then you basically, uh, you do the, the Dalian projection, you dotted the, the, the basis, phi, and then you take the expectation, that equal to zero, right? Then, by solving this, because of the orthogonality, all the basis, right, if i not equal to j, it goes away, becomes zero, because of the Dalian projection, right? Whatever left is become decision problem. So that's why you transfer a stochastic problem become a decision problem by using that. Similarly, you can do a collocation projection. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the philosophy about uh, the final case. Let's look at what's the computation speed up. So basically, if you look at, look at the uniform, right, this is the error you want to achieve for the mean. And uh, if you want to do Monte Carlo, this is the number of sample you need. And uh, this is uh, the polymer care order you, you need, okay? How get the comparable results. So you can, this, you can see, it's, uh, you can have great saving by using a polymer pairs instead of Monte Carlo. But just a caveat here is uh, this assumption, right? You use every argument this assumption, right? If you avoid this assumption, you will get the visible results, okay? So the, the assumption behind it is uh, the PDF you want to approximate smooth, okay? If the PDF is not smooth, it's not good to choose polymer pairs, okay? So, so that's what the first challenge you have to talk about is uh, this is uh, one of the examples uh, for a good part. So for example, I want to uh, solve the never start part, and uh, I assume in the viscosity part there's some randomness in the viscosity, okay? So if I do this benchmark problem, then I increase in the polynomial order P, I can achieve convergence exponential, right? So I get the exponential convergence, everything very nice, so we achieve the spectral convergence, right? This is uh, the, the nice story okay, about the quantum case. Let's look at another not so nice problem. This is a so called uh, the OZEC problem, right? Uh, this is what OZEC created this uh, model to prove that the uh, polynomial case doesn't work for this problem. So, what happened is it's a very simple dynamic system. There's a three variables y1, y2, y3, right? Just for, for these simple dynamic systems, you can see the blue color is the Monte Carlo, okay? And then the pink color is the representative polynomial case, p to the third, very high order, okay? You can see in the early time it didn't match exactly, but the later time you see it, the, the polynomial result deviated from the Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so what happened? It's not like a, the, then people say oh polynomial doesn't work for this kind of systems, right? The reason why is because this system has a bifurcations. Okay, it, uh, it depends on the random initial conditions. Uh, you're choosing this one, this value goes to this trajectory. You choose another value goes to the other trajectory. Okay, so it's not like a smooth transition from uh, the perturbation of the image conditions. Okay, so that's caused a problem. So that's uh, the first challenge, right? So how to resolve the discontinuities in the polynomial case domains, right? So think about it, if you want to do Fourier expansion on a step function, you can encounter the same problems, right? Because uh, I want to do a Fourier expansion on a step function, right? You need a many, many terms to resolve the step function. Right? The same thing, because uh, the, this is a special method, right? you can uh, have similar issues. So that's why, to resolve the discontinuity issue, we develop a so-called multi-element, the property collocation method, and also the uh, generalized polynomial case approach. The idea is, you can chop this uh, PDF uh, with the discontinuity, you can chop the domain into several part, okay? multi-element part. Okay? Then you can do each part okay, using polymer case. It's just like in the finite element domain, we do dual domain decomposition. Right? We just do domain decomposition in the random space. Okay? So you can do similar things, borrow some techniques to apply it in the stochastic domain. So then we can, you, because in, within each domain, the problem becomes smooth, then we can apply this method. Okay? Then you just combine them together, obtain the statistics. So that's so-called the multi element approach. So the second issue with UQ is about so-called cursor of dimensionality, right? basic high dimensional problem. So, to do that, we have developed a series of papers such as a sparse grid, adaptive analysis of variance, that we do comparative sensing with basic rotation, etc. So first I will show you is the first uh, we're using the so-called uh, SOMAX sparse grid algorithm. It's basically instead of doing the full tensor product, right, we can using a sparse grid, sparse quadrature point to achieve a similar accuracy. 
but it greatly reduces the computational cost. So this, uh, this is why we will do that. We also developed several uh, techniques on, based on the compressive sensing to achieve uh, solving high dimension problem. So the idea is instead of always solving a, a problem, right, by using a, solver, a linear solver, here we, we do optimization algorithm, right? We use the compressing to do optimization, okay? With, with L0 norm, L1 norm, I right, try to achieve the compressive sensing algorithms. So however, this accuracy of using compressive sensing depends on whether this problem is sparse or not, right? If this problem is sparse, you get good accuracy. However, if the problem is not sparse, you don't get that good results, right? So therefore, we develop algorithm to improve the sparsity of the problem. So the trick is that we want to basically make the, choosing the right basis to make the problem sparse. So that we have two papers okay, on this to, to iterate here the, to rotate the basis so that find the, uh, the sparse basis so that can choose the optimal algorithms. So the idea is following. Initially, you're choosing a basis such as uh, like a Hermit polynomials, right? Then I can iteratively rotate the basis so that you can see initially your basis are not that sparse. After the, the transformation, I can make the basis, basis even smart, sparser, okay? If the basis becomes smart, sparser, and this one will give better accuracy than this one. Okay, so this is the, the basic idea behind it. What we do is so we're using the, the rotation matrix, okay, use active surface space. We can rotate this basis. Initially, this, I think it's two times we use the this one and say two. We can rotate this basis by time a rotation matrix A to map to eta, right? We can gradually increase the sparsity, right? So then we rotate it again. So at here we convert it, then we're using that to improve the sparsity. Okay, so this is one way we do that. I will show you we solve a hundred dimension random problem, okay? So we input is hundred dimensions, okay? Then we use that to evaluate uh, the sparsity of the problem. So we can greatly improve the sparsity through these uh, rotations. You can say the sparse parameter only three instead of a bunch of them, right? Then we can achieve uh, like a much better convergence. You can say we do it six times, we can achieve a better convergence on that. Okay, so this is uh, just showing you, we use L1 minimization of OMP algorithms to achieve that. So finally, I will talk about how we do like uh, model calibrations on the complex problem, a real world problem. So this I will talk about, about this problem, right? for the regional climate uh, calibrations. So this is, uh, we identify the five different parameters can control the convection scheme in the, in the WOLF. This is a uh, regional climate models, okay? So we use satellite data to calibrate the five parameters. So then we uh, improve the model predictive capabilities. <coughs> we publish it at Mercer in chemical physics, the one of the best in the climate science. This is regional climate models. And we also want to do something for the global climate models. So this is global convection. So the left is uh, the, what the satellite data give you, and the right is what the model give you. Okay? This is uh, the total convection. Of, this is uh, the deep convection and the shallow convection. Okay? So if you compare these two, this uh, expected convection does not have a good prediction, okay? especially in the central Africa region, like central tropical region, it has very bad predictions. You can see here, right? So that, that's motivated to calibrate the parameters. So we identify these 12 parameters, control the convection schemes, and this is what default parameter used by the models, and this minimum and the maximum range we can vary of the 12 parameters. Okay. So we tune these 12 parameters to achieve better. So this is uh, the satellite data. This is uh, the optimal one. So you can see, but through this optimization, we can achieve much better, right? recover this uh, tropic area convections, okay? Compared to this one, they don't have the tropical precipitation at all, right? So we can, but also we can correct a lot of missing physics, right? So that, so that way is uh, uh, basically to calibrate a uh, real world big complex models, okay? The challenge with that is uh, you cannot do using traditional calibration algorithms. Like for example, you do Markov chain and Carlo, all these things will not work here because uh, each run takes you a week, okay? You only can afford like 100 runs. You cannot achieve many runs here, right? So you only can afford, right, a, a few simulations in parallel computers. So all the traditional methods, you have to design a very special efficient algorithm to help you design your experiments, achieve faster convergence. So, so this is uh, for the real world problems. 
Now I'm going to talk about the UQ for deep learning, right? How we can make better predictions. So the idea is we develop a new method to quantify uncertainty in the deep learning of the predictor of the PDE solutions in arbitrary domain. So I, the goal is I want to replace the traditional finite element of finite different solvers and achieve real-time prediction of the PDE solutions and the quantify the uncertainty of social okay. So think about like later on, my goal is to have a cell phone app. Right? If you want to solve a PD problem, right, you use your, your, your finger to draw geometry you want to solve, then you're choosing the, solve, the equation you want to solve, you click, it's going to solve the equation for you, right? just using cell phone instead you need the parallel computers. But behind it is the, the machine learning. Okay? So that's the eventual goal here. So we have paper here on solving this problem. Let's look at that. I define three sets of a problem from simple to difficult. The first simple problem is a Poisson problem on a circle, right? I'll give you a heterogeneous F, a picture of F, fit heterogeneous. And you, you just use machine learning to predict the uniform, okay? In a fixed circle. The second problem is uh, what if I draw any domain, any shape of the domain? You predict the solution for me. And the third problem is uh, what if we make the problem more complicated, solving nonlinear Poisson equation? You give me an image of heterogeneous F, I'll give you the solution solving the nonlinear Poisson equation. Okay, so, so from simple to typical, nonlinear arbitrary shape geometry problems. And uh, so the model setup is the following. It's a, a nonlinear operator L operator on the U equal to the right-hand side of L. So this is a setup of the neural network. So it is a, a encoder-decoder network. So you give me an image of F, right? I go through the encoder step, encoder the information from 128 to 128, we compress, the information to four by four. Remember, it's nonlinear compression, or you can think about nonlinear dimension reduction. Okay, it's the four by four give you a nonlinear like information compression, like extract the useful information behind it. Okay, then you then you do the decoder step, decoder into a one twenty eight by two twenty eight. That's the solution U. Okay, so from the F map to the U. Okay. Different from the all other people does. So you can see my output has two channels. Okay? One channel presented the mean predictions, the other channel predicted the uncertainty, basically the variance of your predictions. So basically tell you, well, so what's the uncertainty associated with your predictions, right? Maybe your data is bad, maybe your like your architecture is wrong, all this kind of information included in this uncertainty bar. Okay. So because I have this uncertainty the variation, so I, when doing my training my neural network, I can start from, I have very big variance, right, on my predictions. Through my tuning my parameters of my neural network, so my, this error bar will, will get shrink, right? So I can just evaluate the variance of my PDF for my predictions, right? If this gets smaller enough of the variance, then it tells me how good my training my neural network model is, okay? So, so that's why it gave me a, a confidence interval in the prediction Right, using the probabilistic loss function instead of just like mean square loss. So let, let's look at the, what's the arrow associated with that. So this is a, a three different problem using uh, Poisson on the circle, arbitrary domain, nonlinear Poisson arbitrary domain. So you can look at like the probabilistic uh, uh, measure. The loss function gives us the smallest arrows, either in the L1 sense or in the L2 sense. I'll give you the smallest arrows. Okay, you can see it can shoot 10 to minus 3 errors, okay, using this technique. So the left is the prediction, right is the, the neural network predictions. So you can see it gives you a kind of a very accurate predictions. Also, this one basically showing you the error bars, the, basically the, the transparent region shows you the error bars of your predictions, okay? So you, you can use that to tell you which area you have larger uncertainties in your predictions, okay? So instead of just give you a prediction, this one give you the confidence interval for your predictions, okay? For your deep learning. I think uh, this is like a first step for people like when they using uh, new app to make PD of the PD solutions, at least to give you a confidence interval. Okay, so the next step is... Uh, yes. Can I ask a sure, question about sure, that? Sure. Um, what, what's its ability to sort of like indicate the, the uncertainty in the solution of something that it hasn't seen as an input. I mean, so... Um, oh, you mean SND? What's SND source, right? Yes, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. what's its ability to indicate its own ignorance, I guess, is another way to phrase it. Oh, so, so for the server, so first of all, it depends on 
maybe your data is not enough, right? Maybe your architecture, basically, like a, a, the, the architecture is not enough. So like a, the neural network layer is not enough. Like a number of neurons not set up enough, right? All this gonna affect that. Like your predictions, okay? So that, that's gonna incorporate all this information. Okay, like model assignment. So, so, so first talk, I'll basically talk about how we can use replace finite element, right? Using deep learning to make predictions, right? If we can go one that step further, we say what finite element cannot do, right? One thing is uh, material failures, the fracture, right? <laughs> so that finite element cannot do because it's large deformations, right? So, so that's why we think, oh, maybe we can use deep learning to do that as well, because that time consuming, right? For the, to predict the, the fracture mechanics, okay? So, yeah, last night you talked with Roman, he does a lot of fracture mechanics, right? So, but it's, it's time consuming, right? Behind it, it's a, it's a peridynamic, okay? So we we'll want to use, to replace the computation expensive fracture mechanics solver to achieve real time prediction of material failure and the fracture propagations. So this, this work we developed, uh, so-called PeriNet. So we published this work, and the Sandia National Lab very interested in this work, right? So they hired my, my graduate students, right, uh, to work for them, right? Even they, he does not have to be at Sandia, they just paid him salary, okay? So you just can work, work for them remotely, okay? So, so why Sandia is interesting? Because it has a lot of applications, such as you can predict uh, like a car collisions, right? So you don't have to uh, use expensive, like uh, doing expensive to put two car collide together, right? You can use this software to predict, right? What's the damage, right? So if you launch a missile, you want to predict uh, what's the missile damage cost the site, right? You can use this one to predict as well. So, so this can be very useful. Also, think about you have cell phone, right? If I drop my cell phone to the floor, it gets fractured, right? Can predict that, right? What's the fracture pattern gonna look like? Right, the, the disasters, the bridge, right, under the constant load uh, generate uh, the fractures. Can predict that, right? This is the, like the hot healthy of the bad bridge using this kind of uh, uh, real-time prediction tools could be useful, right? So the problem is the two parts. The first one I talk about the inverse problem. You give me an image, right? For so uh, like this is a criminal scene, people using a machine gun to shoot a lot of holes, right? And then they take a picture back to the, the police station, so we can help them take this image right, to analyze it, right, to find out which gun they use, what's the bullet they use, which direction they shoot, what's the, the bullet velocity, we can inverse. Okay? This is like just a CSI, we can say watch the CSI, criminal scene investigations. Right? This is like that. Okay? So we take that image back to, to the investigation of the size of the bullet, velocity, angles, all that. Okay? And also we can do follow the problem, right? So basically, you tell me, uh, you, you tell me this, uh, the, the shooting angle and the velocity, I tell you what the fracture pattern is. Just like you tell me how, where you're gonna drop your cell phone, I tell you how it's gonna fracture. Okay, using machine learning. So let's look at how we do that. So we do a flying disc problem, think about like a, you, if you're sh like shooting, you, you throw a flying disc and then you're going to shoot that disc, okay? It fracture materials. So let's say I, give you uh, arbitrary shooting locations. And then I want you to predict, using deep learning, predict the fracture patterns. Assume I want to shoot in this redder area, I want to predict the, the fracture patterns. I generate a thousand data to train my neural network. So this is, a, I have shooting location x, y. I want to predict, a, a return a fracture image of 64 by 64. Okay, so this is a setup. So, so the left is uh, what the reality, and the right is what the prediction is, okay? So you can see it matches the, 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 the patterns. And however, if you look at all the, some details like here, right? It's get blurred a little bit, right? You can see here, right? On these, on these small fractures. The reason why is because this uh, fracture mechan mechanics is very sensitive to your shoot location if you just change the shooting location by 10 to minus three, okay? Because strong nonlinear, it's gonna generate different patterns, okay? So that's why it's a, if for the small fraction area, you will get a little bit blurry. But the benefit you get by using this is to speed up. If you're using the pan dynamic, you need at least a 7.5 second. However, you're using your network, you only need 10 to minus 3 seconds. Okay? So that's what the real time is about. Right? So using this, you don't need parallel computers to do this. You can just use real time predictions. Okay? So that's a, even predict the material failure. 
So instead of just a predictor, just changing the shooting location, I can change the like bullet size, bullet velocity, a lot of different things. So that's why I can change the, the radius of the bullet, the, uh, change the velocity of the bullet, and the hitting locations, right? I change the, make the more input parameters. There's no free lunch, you have to generate more data. So I have to generate 15K data to make predictions. So the, the left is the reality, right is prediction. Again, you can see away from this area, it gets blurred. Yeah. And then this is uh, the, the solution area, this left is solution, right is predictions. So this work also got in the way publishes the work is also interested by the Samsung. The Samsung is interested because they produce, they produce the, the, the chips, right? They were worried about the, the, the stress inside when they assemble the chips. Okay, they afraid of it because they assemble stress kind of generate the fractures. So this, they hired one of my students to Samsung to help them make a prediction of uh, the fracture in the sensor assembly. Okay, so this is talk about the inverse problem. The inverse problem is, uh, I give you like an image, a fracture image, I want you to inverse the radius of the bullet, the velocity angle, and hitting locations. Okay, so then we generate the data and then try to inverse, so it says I give you an image of the fracture image, I want you to go back to inverse, what's the setting of the parameter is? Okay, kind of inverse problem. Right? So this is the nice thing about the deep learning, right? It doesn't matter, it's inverse of forward problem, right? It, you go through the neural network, it gives you the predictions. Right? You treat everything like a prediction. So if we do that, so you can see this is a, like a, a training a validation step, it, with the error was getting reduced, and we can achieve a 95.6 uh, success rate on predictions so of what the parameter setting is. Just give me an image, okay? So this is a, uh, about the inverse problem. Good question. Yes. You mentioned that you generate you generate the data using the paradynamical yep. paradigmatic simulations. Right. So how expensive in terms of computational time is it to generate fifteen thousand data points? So you can say it's like seven point five second per simulation. Per simulation. Then, yeah, you times the uh, yeah, right. yeah right. times the number of sample you want to generate. So in a sense, the neural network is sort of pre-compiling all that work out in the yeah. training period. But the good thing is you can separate the thing, become offline training, and right. then real-time predictions, right? Mm -hmm. You sacrifice the offline training time, right. and then achieve real-time predictions. Right? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But yeah. The, the, uh, I guess materials in the real world are imperfect, and some of these imperfections, like grain structure and so on, yeah. are ultimately fundamental to the material properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you, this, you have to provide the, the equation of state, yeah, yeah, you had to put into there, yeah. You had because to the Sandia is sort of like pursuing Yes, the Sandia have some equation states for some materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we need to talk to them, get the right equation state. Yes. Yeah, we need that. I think this part is most interesting, maybe to you guys, is because we want to learn the physical law from the data. And basically, what's different from other people is this, we want to learn a, a PDE, okay? a symbolic PDE. Okay? I don't give you a black box. Right? Think about like I want to predict the weather tomorrow, right? So I take the data, make a prediction. Think about just a black box, right? If I take this black box to like a, I, I train the data in New York in New York State, I cannot use that in Indiana because different boundary conditions, different initial conditions, right? If I change the input data, also gonna, not gonna work. So it's not very useful, right? But this work I want to, to learn a PDE model for you. Okay, so it becomes useful, is learn really learn the physical law. So the goal is we try to use data to discover the physical law to enable the data-driven scientific discoveries. Okay, so this is one work we published at the, the Presidium Royal Society on this, on the robust data-driven discovery. So the setup is following. We want to build up a, a, a basis functions, contain all the like, uh, information. So you give me only x and y. x input, y is output. Right? This is all information you give, you give to me. Then I learn a PD solution, PD equation for you. Hitting the y and x. Okay. So what I'm doing here is uh, I can compute the derivatives, right? Then you up, so I have assumptions. My assumptions two. First, the system has most case order derivatives. First assumptions. Second, uh, this PDE system only have a uh, these order polynomials. Okay. This is my two assumptions. If this two assumptions does not hold, you just increase the k and the d to higher order systems. Okay. So I only have two assumptions. Then a bit of the basis for the f, right? Contains the case order. Derivatives, okay. So going to cut f1 to the fn. Then, I the, the physical law going to represent by zero equal to f times w, okay. 
Then I take some samples, right? And I can construct a sample matrix F, okay? Then I turn this problem become a regression problem. I just need to get the W. So once I have the W, I have the physical law represented by zero equal to FW. So you can represent any physical law by this formulation, okay? Any physical law. You can think about, because my definition is zero equal to FW, okay? Any physical law can be represented by this way. So it's very general, okay? Can fit any physical law, you can learn from that. Let's look at how it's set up here. It's uh, zero equal to FW, okay? I want to learn the W. If you do the regression directly, you will encounter the first problem is that you will get W equal to zero, okay? No matter what you do, which optimization algorithm you pick. Because W equal to zero is a, a trivial solution for this simple regression problem, right? So there's many ways to do that. One way we solve this problem, we assume one of the W equal to one, we move to the left, and then we solve the systems, okay? So this is one way we do that. So, so I will basically show you what we do here on the learning nervous stocks equations, okay? Assume I don't know anything about nervous stocks equations, okay? I just generated the data U, right? You prime the data U, I, will, I try to learn the nervous stocks equation for you, okay? This is what I'm doing here. This is a leaf driven, okay? I just using data to the, using data driven flow, right? Then I generate data, I try to learn these equations, the two dimensional nervous stocks equations, okay? So, you know, it kind of contains a lot of uh, like a du dx, du dy, second order term, third order term, like all these things, right? You will see, I have, my basis will be huge, right? Could I have thousands of basis, right? You see, initially, if you just blindly choosing your basis, however, because like we have engineer, some engineering training, right? We can use some engineer instinct. What we do is so-called, in my engineering training, I learned this so-called dimensional analysis, right? If I want to learn equation with a du dt, U is meter per second, right? The T is time, right? So what's the scale? Is uh, the meter per second square, right? So on the left side, your scale is meter per second square, and your right side side, each time should be meter per second square as well, right? So whatever your combination of your basis have to give you meter per second square, right? So if you do that, you don't have that many choice of the basis. You only have handsome basis. Right? So this will use some okay, common sense to help reduce the computational complexity. Once we do that, then I can using, apply this algorithm, we can make a prediction by the mean plus minus the standard deviation. So this number tells you confidence interval of your predictions. Okay? This tells you your, what the prediction of the equation is. Okay? So this way, you can tell you how confident you, you are when you're learning some equations. So this is one way to learn the physical law, okay, by using this data driven approach. More interesting things is I asked my student to, to try that using data U, right? He told me, oh, he said I learned a bunch of physical law for you, right? So this is the error bar, okay? We pick the, the law we learned, okay? So you can see total we learned like seven models, okay? Candidate model for me. He learned seven equations. I say choosing the smallest error bars, right? He said, oh, and then find three, okay? Give you three physical laws. Let's look at what first physical law he learned is u du dx plus u dv dy, okay? And then also he learned this one, for example, this one is v du dx plus v dv dy. He learned kind of these two different physical law. But in my training, I never learned that. This is a stock sequence, right? But however, it's kind of data driven approach, right? Not like always give you something you learn from the textbook. However, if you take the u out, what do you get? If you take the u out, they give you the u times u dx plus the, the dv, uh, dv dy, right? What's that? It's the mass conservation, okay? So basically, you just give me data. This machine learning algorithm can discover the mass conservation for you, even if you don't know anything about the mass conservation, okay? So what's this one? It just has a V times in the front. You take the V out, it's still the mass conservation, okay? So why it has a U and a V times in the front? Because I have the constraint on the term has to be the meter per second square unit, right? That's why they have the U and V there, okay? But it gives you the physical law, okay? So that's why I think it's kind of interesting, right? Because this technique can help you to learn some physical law behind it, okay? So this algorithm is, uh, 
we don't care about the bounding condition and initial conditions because of physical law, right? Never start to for any anything, right? It's, as long as it's governed by the never stop equation, you can use the at the New York State, you can use Indiana, right? So this also helps to collect the data. I don't care the data collect from Indiana or collect from New York State. It can be used, right? All can be used here in the physical law behind it. And also, it's very robust and uh, like it, compared to other methods, and also provided the error bars. Yeah, we also develop a lot of uh, our UQ cross scales. So we funded by DOE on the Center for Mathematics for Math Scale Modeling. Okay, so we funded by doing that. We do a lot of red block cell modeling, bio energy storage. And also, we cross different scale couple the molecular dynamic, DPD, and the never stop. So you can do the coupling from the spatial domain and also the temporary domain as well, and quantify the uncertainty for that. I also do a lot of chemical reactions, I do surface reaction using like a KMC, kind of Monte Carlo. So think about, I have a surface reaction with this uh, catalysis, and the, on the back we have the uh, diffusion never storage equation coupled with the surface reactions. So I have the coupling, so you can see I have the gas phase, I have the surface, uh, it's a catalyst on the surface, where I have the surface uh, chemical reactions, how I model the heat transfer and pressure changes, coupled with uh, the reaction kinetics. Uh, so all this uh, multi-scale coupling, how we achieve that. And uh, also, in terms of the, the machine learning, right, we do a lot of machine learning, think about in the, in the cognitive science, all right? Think about, right now, everybody does a prediction, they only can do one thing, right? But how, uh, as a human, our brain can do a lot of things, right? Think about how we do that, I try to learn from that, is that our brain has a different uh, part of the domain, each part of the domain do one function, right? One part of the domain in terms of response to the region, to, to the sum, to different respective. So that why it motivates uh, us to develop so called collaborative neural network groups. So it's about you have multiple sensors, information comes in. I have a task classifier, I can classify the task. Uh, based on the classification of the input, I can send to different neural networks to achieve different tasks, right? Then I combine the information together, make a better predictions. By doing that, I can, uh, on the benchmark test problem, I can achieve much better accuracy compared to other methods. Okay, so this is what I'm doing here. Also, in the material modeling, we, the idea is we want to, to model from the processing structure, we'll be able to predict the performance of the materials. Right? This is a, the ideal goal in the material science. So think about like if I give you the geometry of the materials and the, the load conditions, I want to predict the stress and the stream field. Okay? So this is one work I joined with our aerospace engineer. So they have this, uh, this uh, fiber material, composite materials. So they have fiber, polymer, everything very light materials, right? We do the additive manufacture. We want to say uh, what's the, the additive manufacture design. They can generate the best performance uh, materials, right? To design uh, microstructures. So this is the prediction. The left is uh, our experimental data, right is the predictions, right? You, you can see. This, the, 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 the stress field we can predict where we have larger stress, we can have a 95% uh, like accuracy in the predictions where the hot spot in the high stress stream field. This is another work I want to join with uh, Yahoo Research, right? So this is the work we try to uh, like uh, predict, since about like uh, we do the online advertisement, right? Every time you, you do online, you go to Amazon, you're shopping, right? You click, 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 then they're gonna give you the right advertisement, right? This is an online advertisement business, right? They can generate billions of dollars in revenue. So this is what we are doing. We're working with Yahoo Research. So we develop uh, this, uh, this new uh, architecture. It ha can handle like 40 million of uh, data set, very large data set, okay? It can achieve like only 0.2 microsecond response, okay? And achieve very fast response. So the idea is we try to couple the and this uh, the factorized machine coupled with deep neural network together. Uh, this deep neural network, this is a factorized machine. So, so basically, is uh, this is the uh, factorized machine. Right? It's a linear part and a quadratic part, right? So the idea is we want to basically have this low order and high order feature interactions using this uh, combination have better predictions. The idea is following, right? So assume we have a want to have a design a sparse feature. So we have the left is a low order interaction using the factorized machine. Right is the deep neural network. We combine them together. Then we encourage the sparsity to make a better predictions on the recommendation systems. OK? 
I so, saw, so this way, I think we, we got the invitation to uh, give a talk at uh, Yahoo Research, Tech Pulse, um Forum. So this is basically why Yahoo Research is interested to use this type of on their commercial implementation on their search engine. So, so this is uh, like a 21 million data sets. This is uh, like a 42 million data set, right? This is uh, using our, compared to other traditional methods, we can achieve the, the best performance compared to other work. So, so this is uh, some like uh, online future, uh, ongoing and future work, right? I'm planning to do. So, so my focus will be to do some progress deep learning based on uh, some like a data reduction, feature extraction, and the signature discovery in the big streaming data on the complex networks such as smart grid, cyber security, social networks. And uh, another thing I'm doing, I didn't even have time to talk about today, is I'm doing a lot of this so-called multi-agent uh, proxy deep reinforced learning, adaptive control. Right? So, so you guys are seeing this like a Boston Dynamics, right? So all this behind it is the reinforced learning, right? So also we're doing also like a Uber uh, rerouting controls, right? So everything like everything we also behind this reinforced learning, okay? So can you monitor the control traffic, right? So we do a lot of that, and also I'm right now I'm using my try to learn the physical law, right? I try to apply it to learn the turbulent closure models, right? So we try to develop a better a closure for the RANS model for the LIC model using the DNS data. So what I'm doing right now. Uh, so do a lot of uh, large scale Bayesian parameter estimation inverse modeling and the multi-sensor data fusion using bigger data can be applied for the climate models, self-driving cars, robotics, etc. And uh, also we can on this uh, using deep learning for the multi-scale algorithms. Because uh, before, without the deep learning, right, we can do some simple multi-scale algorithms, right? But however, if it's some strong transient uh, complex problem, I think we need the help from the deep learning it can help us the better company. And uh, so finally, I have five minutes to talk about the, the consulting service I'm doing, right? So at Purdue, I'm trying to build uh, this data science ecosystems, right? We try to, I have uh, this consulting service. So I build this so-called uh, corporate with the national lab partnerships. We also have the data science start incubators. We have summer camp and the data science club learning communities. All that, we build up the data science ecosystems. So this data science consulting I'm leading at is try to, uh, uh, provide hands-on consulting service on the data analysis and the uh, business analyst in different areas on, on, on the research educations and the business. So the mission is so we try to establish a leading role okay, in the consulting for research education and industry clients. And we are, right now we achieve this self-sustainable efficient, right? So we can sustain ourselves using external funding from the corporate partners. And then we provide a data science focal point for federal, state, and private industry to engage through our consulting service. And then we also provide a unified consulting platform, right, so that with different expertise of faculty to collaborate and provide a unified consulting service for industry partners. Because we know industry partners, they don't want just one service. They want many different things, right, such as they want a, from business school, they can provide some business consulting. They want us to provide some data analytic work, right? They need like a different perspective. They don't want just a one thing, right? They need a different things, right? So they need a mechanical engineering, they need a set of aerospace, they need a different things. So, so that's why this platform might be useful for them to provide okay, one unified kind of front. So this is basically the business we covered. We have business analysts and the business intelligence. We provide the information management, okay? We, methodology, data exploration, HPC. We also have the right proposals, okay, manuscript together. And uh, in terms of education, so we train students with real world data, okay, I have vertical integrated senior grad students with undergrad so they can train them through the uh, teamwork. And also we train them using large scale GPU clusters and also I require my consultant to be able to analyze visual and presentation writing skills so that they have this uh, combined training set. Okay. And eventually we build these uh, learning communities. So I will showcase some, some case studies. So one case we do the image classifications of uh, and that's the estimation of uh, our Indiana. We have the white tailed deer across Indiana. We want to estimate what's the population. So we have this uh, uh, the motion cameras. We put the hundreds of motion cameras in Indiana. We want to know. We're shooting some the camera image. We want to estimate how, how many years we have, right? So, but this created some challenges on like uh, transferability of the machine learning. Okay, I have this tool developed for Indiana. Can I use this tool for like, New York State, right? 
but the background is different, right? The, the, the tree is different, right? The background is different. Like, in the end, it has a lot of farms, right? Here, if you don't have farms, maybe, yeah? So what's the transferability on machine learning tool, right? So, so we are doing that. And this is another work I work with Chrysler, okay? So for this industry partners. So they give us the data on this uh, cross-member casting. The casting is uh, the melting uh, materials that are casted to a form, okay? The framework. So, but this problem is very dependent on the humidity, right? On the quantity of the product, right? So using through this uh, quantity control study, we can identify what's the best humidity range to, to improve the, uh, the product rate, uh, success rate of the products. Uh, so this is one work with uh, Chrysler, we have a paper with it. And uh, this is another work on the image with so-called Cryo EM, that's a facility, right? It's a very expensive facility, image facility, on the kind of frozen of the samples, then they take image, okay? So doing that, so basically, uh, they have a camera here, okay? They take an image of the samples, uh, okay? So the, the goal is to try to do some 3D reconstructions, okay? From 2D image to reconstruct 3D shapes, okay? However, the challenge is uh, this instrument, okay? So they have only, like, can take a picture on a few views. They can not take, like, 360 degrees, yeah? Because the, the, the camera is from the top, okay? So they only can take a few images on the top, so they only have a limited view of the samples. So how to generate a 360-degree view of uh, this uh, 3D samples is a challenge. So that's what motivated to use deep learning. So we use so-called deep uh, generative model. So I just scan. We can generate fake images using the training images, right? So this is what we are doing. You, you, you input the training set, right? Using GAN, you see, this is a, through this GAN, I can generate a lot of fake image, can recover the missing data. Okay, so because I only have limited view, but I can use machine learning to help us recover the limitation of the instrument. Okay, so this is what I'm doing here. This is another work on the Ebola disease control, right? So Ebola is outbreak, how to, using like a, a data science to get the data, help them to better control the outbreak of Ebola disease. So we designed the, the control strategy uh, to help uh, on the modeling side and also on the control side of the Ebola outbreak. So finally, I will talk about, about the building of the data science learning community. So we work with different community, agriculture, B-school, actual science, biology, okay, okay, data visualizations. So we have the data mining learning communities. So what we are doing here, one region. So we have a, the large scale living uh, learning communities. So we basically have an undergrad in a one dining hall. Okay? We have like around 800 undergrads. We put them together, eat together, learn together. Okay? I think it's like a traditional England, like a, like they do like that, right? So we try to really like do that, and also like one place, okay? So we have a kind of dining hall, and all we can, we have a unique experience. Like we have corporate partners sign up, right? We have Sandia, Rolls Royce, like a Ford, UPS, all these sign up. So they provide us project, and we give them a project. So they work as a team, okay? So I was in charge of this corporate partner sections on that. So. So it's quite very successful. So the student learn in the community. Okay? So learn the open source tools, uh, the active learning about uh, the data, doing projects, and they also learn all these computation tools together. So I think if I have the opportunity to come in here, I think I can help build on the data science AI ecosystems at Stony Brook. So I can use my experience on launching this data science consulting service for faculty, students, and the corporate partners. It's to data science and the master programs, and also create a data science learning community here, and the plan on such as the data science online education program. So at Purdue, we bought the Kaplan University. Uh, it's one of the biggest uh, online education. So, so we have this kind of business model, try to encourage uh, faculty to do the online education, right? So we are doing right now, I think it's, uh, it's very successful. I think it will be interesting. Yeah, because your resources are be limited, right? So online is the way to go, right? So, also, I can help to expand the collaboration between DOE Lab, corporate partners, and the Zoom book. Okay, I can help you. Because uh, I work for DOE Lab for over seven years, and I have a very strong collaboration with them. Also, the, we have Rose Royce, Sandy, also, yeah, we work them together. So finally, I want to close my talk with a quote from Dr. Wiener, because I had worked uh, in the closest possible ways with physical engineers, so I knew that our data can never be precise. Thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, we do from Plan S. Uh -huh. uh, thanks a lot. Uh, very nice talk.
And the thing is, uh, many, many topics very interesting uh, when thing is about climate modeling, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so in, actually for the, some recent hurricanes, the severe ones, the European models did much better yeah. job than the American models, right? Mm -hmm. now, now the thing is, you any you heard about any plan to help using machine learning and other you know, kind of, you know, statistical error uh, estimation to improve the uh, American model, for example, you, you talk about very motivating is to learn the underlying real physics model. Mm -hmm. And is that possible you can do that to, you know, if the Europeans refuse to give you their model, can you figure out what their model is? But this is all community, the other model, right? I think uh, it's possible. I think one way to do that is so-called like a, you think about like a, like a degenerated this uh, report, right, to predict global warming, right? So one way to do that is so-called use model average, right? You take the like 20, 22, 20 current model all over the world, right? Then they draw them together, then they take the average, right? The, the theory basically says if you take the model average in predictions, it's better than use a single model predictions, right? So somehow if you average the different model predictions, because each model has its own strengths, right? So if you do something like this kind of average model, so relatively give you more robust uh, predictions compared to just using like American models. Yeah. The, the, the model that. combination is a big topic in statistics yes, as a yes, statistician. Yes, so, yeah, so yeah. there are various of ways of uh, different weighting yeah, and, and yeah, but yeah, but, yeah. but I, I would say that is very interesting. Yeah, this is one way to do that, right? This is called model averaging, right? You can choose some weights, use machine learning to help you tune the weights, is one way, right? The other way is called model selections, right? So I can help you select the model, you give me the data hiring mm -hmm. predictions, I can tell you. I can dynamically choose in the right model, and maybe I can automatically like choose a European model, right, more on, on fitting instead of the American model, automatically using data driven approach. This is the second approach, right? The third approach is I can using this machine learning to help you to find a better closure, right, for the American models, right? So that's a, the third way. It's a new way, right? I think it has the potential. Yeah. So uh, the I guess my question is somehow related to that. So uh, I, I'm coming more from molecular electronic structure, where superficially we're solving the Schrodinger equation, which is high dimensional equation. If you've got many electrons, it's three in dimension. Yeah. But it's a nice linear equation. So if it wasn't so high dimensional, you could solve it. Mm -hmm. But we uh, we also know that there exists an exact model uh, that just works with the three dimensional density. But we don't know the operator basis. It's we know it's non-local. We know it's non-linear. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like your approach was successful if you could guess somehow or had physical intuition into what that basis was. So can you extend it somehow? Is there a path forward? Yeah. So that's a so-called model reduction, right? So, so one way I'm working on is so-called Maurice Wanzek formulations on the model reductions, right? That can help you to take a so Maurice Wanzek reduction is exact. Right, if you know right the kernels, right? But normally people complain about this uh, the, the the memory kernel normally very complicated, right? So right now I'm doing is to try to using the data driven to learn the, the memory kernels can achieve the more like a significant reduction, right? Can simulate more complex problems. So that's a way using machine learning to help you to achieve this model reduction. Yeah. I think yeah, possible. Yeah, by the way, I think, you know, that's the way, the areas that we can collaborate um, in statistics, I we have a lot of uh, uh, research in this direction. Yeah. You know, we do the regularization. Regularization. So, yeah. so try to, to force some parameters yeah, into yeah. zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But absolutely very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah because one well, of the mission, actually, for the university is for the environmental science. Actually, yeah. we have this ongoing collaboration, right? So the, the question is, we have this physics model. They added this, you know, stochastic noise, you know, as we are statisticians. But like, how do we use machine learning to further improve this, right? Mm -hmm. To really uncover the physics rule that we don't know. Maybe our models totally wrong. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think also it's like uh, so. Another thing I'm doing right now: how to in incorporate all these uh, physical law constraints in the machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. So because think, think about sometimes so when you do the prediction about the density, right? The density cannot be negative, right? But sometimes you, you, you view the regression, we you give the data because of the fluctuation in noise of the data, sometimes you predict negative density, right? But it, you don't want that, right? Because that, that, that doesn't make sense at all, right? So, so how do you incorporate all these constraints into the physical, into the statistics models, right? That might be interesting as well, right? Yeah. It's so-called physical information, right? So this uh, data science consulting, mm -hmm. uh, 
company. What's the uh, funding model? I mean, are they paying? Are companies paying on a per job basis, or are they paying to be a member of? No, yeah. So we have a called recharging center. We charge by hour. Yeah. So basically, they say, oh, so we first buy hundred hours to do this work, right? So then they give me a hundred hours time, right? The money coming here. We have fixed rate for the hours, right? They give us money, then we fall to our recharging center, then we work for them by hours. It's like a typical consulting firm like that, but we're just a lot cheaper, yeah, compared to an outside firm. But do they have to be members in order to have the privilege? They don't have to. They don't okay. have to. Yeah. Make it flexible. Right? They don't have to have a yeah every yearly <laughs> yearly fee, right? To sign up for that. Yeah, they don't have. To. Questions? You could have many more than me. No, well, we'll <laughs> you have time. We'll discuss later. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.